Okay, so I just wanted to show you um, how to look up unknown peaks with their spectra. Um, so we will go ahead and pull up um, anywhere on this analysis page, whether you're in batch view or anywhere. Uh, if you click on tools and you click launch qual explorer, the first one, um, it pulls up a separate window and this is how you can look at the spectra of each of your peaks. Um, so what you'll have to do is open the file. So we'll go to open. Um, this pathway is a little bit um, cumbersome, but bear with me. So click on computer and then you'll go to your C drive. Double click that. Then you scroll down to trace finder data. Open that up and then 32 or 33, um, which is 3.2, which is the version we're on. Uh, projects, click on that, and then you'll go by year, <laughs> and then whatever month we're in. So we're in June right now. So uh, I was gonna pull up this calibration file that was recently run. Uh, and then you'll go to the data folder, and here are the data files. So yeah, it's a little bit hard to get to there. Uh, after much practice, I have memorized it, but don't be upset if you haven't yet. <laughs> so anyway, um, I was just going to pull up one of these calibration files I ran. Let's just pull one up here. So um, actually, I can pull up the quantitation report still, so I can still use TraceFinder at the same time. So we're on the Cal4 file here. So you can see that like these three peaks were not integrated. So um, before I would go and adjust them, I would verify which peaks they are in case um, one's, you know, like a contamination or something. So I just want to make sure before I start changing retention times. So for instance, let's just look at this last one, 9.11. So we'll minimize that and go back to the call explorer. Sorry, a little slow there. Okay, so um, the way this works, so here's your, this is your chromatogram, um, your TIC, um, and this will be your spectra down here. So this, these two pins here are telling it which one you're working on. So right now it defaults there, but I'm gonna go ahead and pin the top so that I can highlight. Um, so yeah, I'll just click that once. And then I want to I want to zoom in. So what I'm going to do is just click and drag uh, my peak of question here. So I'm going to just do that, and it'll zoom in for you. So it just gives you a little bit better look um, without seeing everything, especially if it's a smaller peak. It's nice to zoom in. So then what I'll do is I'll actually click this pin to put it back to the spectra side. And all I would do is I would click on one of the peaks. And here's the spectra for that peak. And to look at this one, I would just click on that as well. And that's a different spectra. So to show you again, um, they're actually really similar compounds, which probably makes sense. They're probably um, isomers or isotopes of each other. So, um, but anyway, so in order to search the library, so the NIST library has thousands of com known compounds um, and they'll kind of do like a, almost like a probability based on those masses of what matches. So here, what we'll do, so I'm, I've selected this spectra and I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna go to library and search. And what this will do is pull up the results uh, against the NIST library. So. Here we've got 1,3-dichlorobenzene. So um, the way you would kind of use this, so here's actually a look at this first. So this is your, your sample. So this is our Cal4 sample, and here's our main library. So it's the comparison of the two spectra. So you can see the largest um, mass that came off was the 146. So that matches pretty well, as well as the 148, the 111, 75, 50, and so on. So it's using, you know, algorithms and things to determine 
how close of a match this is. And it's t telling us that it believes that that is the number one choice. Um, and luckily it is one of our calibrated compounds, so <laughs> I would agree. Um, and the way you would use this top part um, is you would actually, so most people like to look at this probability, but I was actually told by Thermo that that's not the best indicator of what's accurate. Um, you actually want to look at the SI and the RSI values and what this, so if the SI and RSI values are at least above 800 um, to 1000 or so, that's a good match. So the, the higher the better. So if, uh, especially if both values are high, then you definitely uh, can trust that it's a good match. So, you know, like here, it's like, okay, 500, yeah, that's pretty low. 700 is also low, not a great match, but these three and the 900 values are gonna be your best. Um, but as you can see, it is a nice tip. So one, two dichloro versus one, four dichloro and then one, three dichloro. So um, I'm gonna go with the top one just because I, you know, I would trust that that's um, the most accurate, but we can verify that this one so we'll do the same process. So I'm gonna just click on that to bring up its spectra. Right click, library and search. And here's 1,4 dichlorobenzene. So um, that makes sense. So the 1,4 is the 9.03 retention time and the 1,3 was the 9.11. So then I would, um, if you're doing a calibration integration um, and updating retention times, then I would just write that down and then go, um, the other video had shown how you go into the master method and update those. So I just wanted to show you how you would verify uh, the actual identification of those compounds. Um, I'm gonna show one other example. Um, bear with me while I switch screens here. Okay, so here's another example. So this, um, would be if you maybe see a little blip on your chromatogram and you're not sure if it's a peak or what it is. Um, <clears throat> so this is a raw file here and I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in and okay yeah that looks like a little peak so maybe we'll go investigate and see what it is. So um, we will do the same thing. So I'm going to minimize this. Go once it loads. <laughs> Tools, Launch Call Explorer. Go to the open folder. Computer, C drive, trace finder data, 32 projects, the year, the month, and this was on the 25th, this one here. Oh, sorry, we ran it twice. Okay, so there's our raw file. <clears throat> So we'll pull that up. Um, so again, you'll click this top pin to use the chromatogram um, and to zoom in is easiest. Uh, I'll actually show you a few of these toolbar options also. So let me just highlight a little bit. Um, and that's the peak that I had in question. I mean, you can also investigate any little peaks as well. If you wanna go back to the full screen, um, while this pin is selected, you can click on this kind of X looking shape and that resets your zoom so it goes back to your full size. Um, actually, I'm not, I don't really use any of the other ones to be honest. Uh, but you know, you could always play around with it if you'd like. So I will go ahead and zoom back in. We'll do these both of these peaks. So I'm going to pin the spectra now and I will just click. I like to line it up to the top of the peak, um, to the apex, because Technically, your spectra could change throughout the entire peak um, because it scans so many times with, within each, um, I think, per second that it could change your spectra, or especially if there's two different 
uh, co-eluting peaks, then you might get a different spectra. So the apex is usually the, the safest bet for when you're identifying. Um, so, okay, we clicked on that. We come down to the spectra here, right click, go to library and search. And um, as you see, uh, the values are not that great, 600, 700, you know, can we trust it? Not sure, you know, sometimes it's just taking the, the highest probability and we're not sure how accurate it really is. I mean, if you look at the spectra, I mean, the two masses are there, but, you know, they don't quite exactly line up. So sometimes what could happen though is um, the software gets bogged down with the background noise. So one thing you can do is subtract it out. So what you would do is right click in the spectra while the pin is highlighted here and you actually go to subtract spectra. And I always do two ranges. And so we'll click on that. And then what you would do is you would click on the baseline just to the left and just to the right of the peak in question. So I'm gonna pick a certain point here and I'm gonna click. And then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna click. So that is now, so what that did is it took this current spectra and it subtracted whatever it's finding within this baseline. So then I'm gonna go ahead and do a library search again. Sometimes it changes and sometimes it doesn't. So we'll see, it's still a, a non-name. So it's a, you know, a similar isomer of what it was saying before, but the probability got a little bit better. We've got, you know, higher 700s, 800s. So um, I believe these compounds are just kind of um, garbage peaks that can kind of come off maybe from a dirty column. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much, but at least you can I, go through the steps to identify if it was something um, that of, of worry. So we'll do this little one as well. You know, it was about the same masses here, but we'll go ahead and do the search. It's probably going to be the same compound. Oh another decking. So decane is um, used as an industrial solvent. So chances are it probably got in at some point and just contaminated the column. Um, and the main reason I would say that is because if you pull up the other um, samples from that, even that same run and previous runs, we tend to still see these compounds. So, you know, we see both of those little peaks coming through in the blanks. Um, so to me, that indicates that it's in the column somewhere. So it's probably a contamination. So that might be a good point to realize that uh, you might need to trim the column or clean the inlet. Um, or maybe just do a whole PM on the instrument if, um, if those two don't really work to get it out. It could also be in the trap, in the Persian trap, but I would assume it's within the column. Probably the, the latter end of the column might need a trimming since they're pretty heavy compounds um, coming off this late. So yeah, so that's kind of how you would at least investigate when you do see little peaks like that, um, especially in raw. But you know, if you see it consistently throughout the non-raw samples, then it kind of indicates that it's probably not something currently in the river, but definitely not something to just completely ignore. I mean, you definitely want to determine if it's a true contamination um, or if it's something you can clean out. And you can sometimes run like four drops of methanol mixed with DI water um, in a 40 mil vial and you could run that a few times uh, with some blanks through your whole system, like through your Persian trap um, and then into the GC. And that methanol might help clean out whatever gunk has accumulated over time. Um, if, and especially if trimming your column didn't do anything. But so that's kind of a few solutions for that. But I would um, definitely say these are definitely within the instrument versus in the samples. But 
So that was kind of just the overall how you use the qual browser um, to investigate and to identify unknown peaks. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it.